Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. All right. This is great. Um, as I imagine all of us have heard and many of us have expressed, this is a unique community of people. Gathered in this room are experts on a panoply of religious traditions, an array of methodologies and disciplines, people who are collectively fluent in dozens of different languages, ancient and modern, people who study communities and individuals of time periods and geographies uh, as seemingly distant as ancient Mesopotamia and the south side of Chicago, people who collectively have generated hundreds of books, thousands of articles, people who have contributed and who will contribute an incalculable amount of knowledge and understanding to the world, people who have served and will serve congregations and communities and individuals and bring comfort, healing, and justice to the world, people who have done no more and no less than the profound act of giving our attention to the voices of others and helping one another as friends, colleagues, and professionals. And that's just the people in the room with us right now, who has been in this room and by extension this building, and who will be in the future. This has been the birthplace of ideas that have changed the way we understand what it means to be human. In this place, teachers and ministers and scholars have honed their skills, found their voices, and acquired the knowledge to be intelligent and effective leaders. In this place, friendships have been formed, scholarly relationships have been built, and yes, even families have been born. The people who have walked these halls and taught and learned in these classrooms are with us, as are those who will come in the years and decades hence. As scholars of religion, we know the unique centrality of ritual and ceremony to the life of a community. The Divinity School is full of rituals, from convocation to Wednesday lunches to qualifying exams to going down to grounds of being every morning for a cup of coffee. In my mind, today's ritual is meant to accomplish two major objectives. The first is to welcome the incoming cohort of 2018, 79 new students who bring with them an inspiring array of experiences, interests, backgrounds, and stories who will enrich our community and be enriched by it. We are so grateful that you have joined us and so delighted that you are here, and I invite you to please stand so the rest of us can welcome you officially. The second purpose is, in a larger sense, to enact and perhaps renew the sense of the Divinity School as a community. Perhaps uniquely, this is a ceremony without a transaction. No degrees are being conferred, no awards are being presented. The school year would start whether or not we were here today. But we are here, and in the readings and remarks that follow this morning, I hope that we all might connect or reconnect with the richness and diversity of this special community, that we might be reminded of who we are and why we are here, and that we might be inspired to consider what we might become. Thank you for being with us this morning. Best wishes for a year that is fruitful, productive, challenging, and that brings you and all of us insight. Welcome to the Divinity School. Hello, my name is Yusuf Kaiswit. I'm delighted to be here. I'm an assistant professor of Quranic studies. I teach classes on Islamic thought, um, Quranic studies, and uh, manuscript editorial technique, among others. And uh, I was asked uh, by our dear dean of students to uh, present or talk about a text for three minutes uh, that somehow captures uh, uh, something of the debates and the discussions of the intellectual world that I'm uh, immersed in on a daily basis. So I chose a treatise by an Andalusian uh, uh, poet called Abu al-Hasan al-Shushtari. 
Now Shushari is known as the Rumi of the Islamic West, which means that he's the most famous voice of Sufism or Islamic mysticism in Arabic, in contrast uh, to Rumi who wrote in Persian. And I, I, I discovered this treatise in a, a neglected collection in Turkey, uh, and uh, I have been working on it and uh, thinking about it for a while now because it, it's one of the few places where this famous poet who, who influenced Raymond Lull and others, uh, even on the sort of European side, where he expresses himself in prose. And so he divides uh, the ways of knowing God into three modes. Uh, rational belief, which is uh, the, the commoner's approach, which is the, the way of the scholastic theologian who try to seek proof for God's existence on the basis of creation. God creates, he puts you in here, he gives you your sense faculties so that you can ponder him through his signs which are everywhere around you. And so the rational theologian, in this case, in the Islamic tradition, would be the mainstream Asharite theological tradition, which is occasionalist. In other words, it believes in every moment being sort of an occasion that isn't causally linked with the next, like a movie being projected onto a screen. And it's also atomistic. In other words, it believes in uh, the world consisting of atoms uh, that, that are divisible and they contain accidental qualities like water has a wetness as its accidental quality and those accidental qualities are, are um, uh, non-eternal. Everything in this world is an atom, so therefore this world is non-eternal. Only God is. That's the way that the theologians rationalize it. And so Shusteri explains the theological approach. Uh, and, and, and he says, uh, none of these approaches contain God. None of them can embrace his mystery. None of them can really express it, not even mystical knowledge. So the highest level is, of course, pure silence. Uh, but the theologian establishes uh, uh, proof, quote-unquote, for God or for the artisan, a sanya, on the basis of the artisanry, uh, what he makes. Uh, like uh, an artist inherently leaves his or her marks on his or her artistic productions without even trying. Like, my words right now inherently leave something of who I am that's inexpressible in audible form. Um, that's the theological approach. And he goes into details about this, uh, and you can, you can read the, sort of the specifics of the argument. Then he reverses the equation in the second part. He says the Sufis, on the other hand, the mystics, who are interested in lived, realized experience of what the theologians are actually talking about, they begin in the same place. They begin by rational inquiry and they end up reversing the equation because they realize that, according to Shusteri, it's things out there that need to be proven, not God. Because they, the, the ontological relationship between creator and created is, 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 is preceded uh, uh, by, the, by the divine absolute reality. So he says for the Sufis, they begin with the theologians at the beginning and then when they delve more deeply into it, they realize that it is the things that need a, 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 a proof, not the other way around. And so he quotes a, a beautiful poem, Thou thyself reveal, then dost thou conceal. Thou provest thyself the proof in I. But Shusteri doesn't stop there. He pushes it further. He says the Sufis are sort of midway to realization. The full realization is by, the, by his group. He, he places that at the center of the... That's how he self-identifies within the Islamic tradition. And he says, um, the final ones don't even see things out there. Right? The theologians say, oh, look at these things, they prove God. The Sufis say, look at God, he proves the things. And the realizers, the muhaqqiqun, they say, what things? They're just veils, and I only see God through them. Uh, and so he established a school that was called Wahd al Wahd al Mutlaqa, the school of absolute oneness, which is a non dualist tradition, very, very powerful and strong within the Islamic tradition that's engaged with philosophy and theology and mysticism, and that becomes the dominant form of discourse in the Islamic religious tradition from the 13th century onwards, which is when Sushari lived. Have a good year. <laughs> After that, only silence could follow. <laughs> but I won't be silent because I have been given a charge. I'm David Nuremberg, the interim dean of the Divinity School. And um, for hundreds of years, communities of scholars have gathered to celebrate the beginning of a new year with discourses, with benedictions. 
So today we celebrate the beginning of the 163rd year of the collective life of the Divinity School. Morgan Park Seminary of the Baptist Theological Union was founded in 1856, long before the University of Chicago, and then brought to the University of Chicago in 1890. Thomas Goodspeed of Goodspeed Hall, and a number of the halls of the quads are named after the people of the Baptist Theological Union who did that, without which this university would not stand. And I begin with a benediction. May every instant of your coming year in this extraordinary space of research and learning, this space dedicated to ideas, even at their most difficult, bring you a renewed sense of the possibilities for your own thought and discovery. Now, I introduce this in terms of a tradition, but those of you who have been here in previous years know that this gathering is an innovation, bid'ah, but I hope not a heretical one. <laughs> uh, the Divinity School has not traditionally celebrated uh, its annual regeneration, perhaps because as critical scholars of ritual, myth, and religion, we find it difficult to revel unselfconsciously in pomp, <laughs> rhetoric, and the accreted symbols of culture. We know only too well that ceremony is often enough a performance of tradition and hierarchy rather than a stimulus to the critical thought to which we are committed as a community dedicated to the academic study of religion. So whereas many of our peer institutions, well, we have no peers. <laughs> so as many other schools <laughs> gather every fall in solemn ceremony with gowns and regalia to ask the gods of the academic calendar for a propitious year, we've traditionally just gotten to work without pausing to perform the commitments that bind us. We're right to be suspicious of unreflective celebration. Certainly, we must constantly interrogate our values, lest they ossify into ideology. But we should celebrate those values insofar as we find them good. And our return each year to Swift Hall is indeed precious. So today, let us engage joyfully in something that as scholars of religion we never get to do. Today we get to create a ritual rather than merely analyze one. So what to say at the foundation of a ritual of commencement? The task is intimidating, not least because such great thinkers have already dedicated themselves to it. Here at the University of Chicago we speak often of John Dewey and the aims of education lecture. My own personally exemplary example, that's redundant, my own uh, exemplary figure in this regard is uh, the philosopher Giambattista Vico, whose inaugural orations uh, at the University of Naples in the years from 1699 to 1707 are beautiful, uh, and I, I offer them to you. They've been published in English translation with the title On Humanistic Education. So instead of providing my own manifesto, I'll cheat by simply attempting to describe what it is that we are celebrating. And what is that? Every member of this community will have a different answer to that question, and you'll soon hear from others. But from my point of view, we are celebrating our entry, our return, to a peculiar space and temporality of life and thought, the space of the university and within it, the especially dis distinctive space and temporality of the Divinity School. So first, a word about what makes the space of the university distinctive, apart from its Gothic architecture, which you can't find anywhere else in the city of Chicago. Ever since their origins in the Middle Ages, universities have been institutions committed to values and ideals that are slightly different from those of the world around them. In universities, as one of the founders of the University of Paris put it, Peter Abelard, in the 12th century, what should count is not power, dogma, or authority, but the quality of argument. And we judge that quality by the critical tools of the disciplines we come here to cultivate. To quote Abelard, we set aside the weapons of war and we take up the weapons of dialectic. As that military metaphor suggests, those arguments can be competitive, even combative 
but they're rooted in the ideal that universities exist as institutions and we exist as scholars in order to test ideas, that knowledge is better than dogma and that in pursuit of knowledge, what counts is, the po- is not the popularity of an argument, nor the seniority, wealth, or relative social power of the person who articulates it, but its excellence as a critical approach to a problem, to a question, to truth. Institutions always fall short of their ideals, at least if those ideals are lofty enough to be worth holding. Certainly the medieval University of Paris did. Within decades of its birth, it was condemning scholars and theses that some of its members found unacceptable. In every institution, as in every individual, hierarchy and power can assert themselves over excellence of argument, habit and dogma can dull critical commitments, and the many failings of human life in the world can become manifest. Alas, this is true even here. The institutions, universities, the institutions of society that are most explicitly dedicated to critical ideals, which is simply to say that however good our intentions and our efforts, all of us, both as individuals and as a community, will undoubtedly fall short of our ideals over this coming year. When we do, it's our urgent obligation, both as individuals and as a community, to recall ourselves to those ideals. It's only because universities have been uniquely committed to criticism that they have been so important to humanity. The more those ideals are embattled within our broader society, and I dare say they're very embattled within our broader society, the more humanity needs you to cultivate and defend them even when, especially when, it's ourselves we need to criticize. So never hesitate to point out whenever you find us or yourselves falling short of these ideals. So I see that in true Chicago style, I've stopped being celebratory and become somber and critical. This is, after all, the place where fun comes to die. (laughs) Forgive me, what I meant to say is... Welcome to the unique space of a great university, a space where critical thought is celebrated, and welcome to another year of the unique temporality of a great university, a temporality in which the relentless tick-tock of the world quiets down just enough for us to be able to ask the kinds of questions that take years rather than minutes to answer or that may have no answer at all. So far, I've been talking about universities and not about our divinity school, where there is even more to celebrate and more to affirm, for our ideals are in some ways even more challenging and more marvelous than those of any other institution of higher learning I know. Let me try to explain briefly what I mean. Our community brings together different values and forms of commitment that are less and less often found together in the world, and that are, I submit, even more rarely found anywhere else in a university. Commitments of faith, commitments to the critical engagement with a religious tradition or with more than one, commitments to academic distance from or passionate engagement with the problems of the world around us, each of us in the Divinity School brings a different combination of these to our common intellectual life. Here, we're forced to confront those differences, to question and justify them, to engage in a common life despite and because of them. This is an extraordinarily difficult task. It's more challenging than that found in many seminaries or departments of religious studies, where it's all too easy to find a space in which one can obtain a Master of Divinity degree without having to engage critically with the texts and history of one's chosen tradition, or in which one can pursue the academic criticism of religion without ever being exposed to colleagues who take its constructive possibilities seriously. And it's more challenging than that pursued in any other academic discipline of the modern university, for where one is rarely asked, I would say one is never asked, to imagine how the questions of one's chosen discipline might relate to questions about how life should be lived. That separation was one of the great achievements of the modern university, and it created space for all kinds of inquiry, but it also opened an abyss between our academic inquiry and much that is vital to us as beings. 
In the rest of the academy, that abyss is fenced off and and, uh, prohibited or posted off by disciplinary prohibitions. But precisely because of the diversity of commitments and engagements that we cultivate in Swift Hall and that, that temptation of the terrifying attempt to overleap that abyss remains. That temptation, that potential for the unexpected, even explosive intersection between the questions of our chosen discipline and those that have the power to move our own sense of being is what makes our common intellectual life exhilarating, fruitful, and sometimes, yes, also dangerous and intimately personal. This is why our common life in the Divinity School, perhaps more than any other space in the university, requires not only criticism, but also charity. Criticism and charity. So if there's a value and an ideal that I hope our ritual performs today, it is that of charitable criticism and critical charity. Now, I can think of no better speaker to represent that rare combination, that ideal, than Paul Mendes Flohr, the Dorothy Grant McClear Professor of Modern Jewish History and Thought. Professor, and if I'm soaking up, it's because I've lived that combination in him personally. Professor Mendes Flohr joined the faculty in January 2000. He is famous to the academic world as an expert on modern Jewish intellectual history and specifically on the thought of Martin Buber, among many other things. He is, in other words, an academic critic of the very highest order. But anyone whose life has intersected with his knows him also as an embodiment of charity. Students, staff, faculty all have a story of his kindness, of his warmth, and of his attention to the lives of people around him, from the daughters of staff members who know that he's an easy mark for selling Girl Scout cookies to, even though he never eats them himself but only gives them away. to faculty colleagues. I know I'm not the only one he has visited on his, no, my sick bed, or to whom he has literally given the shirt off his back. But I may be the only one to whom he's literally given the shirt off his back. I once admired his shirt, and he gave it to me. (laughs) His home is open to students. How many of you have been there, perhaps, after a Jewish studies workshop? And his heart is open to all of us. His criticism is never uncharitable, even if his charity is sometimes uncritical, which is a virtue. (laughs) So please join me in welcoming Professor Paul Mendes Flohr, who will speak to us on scholarship as a priestly craft. Welcome. Uh, Let me begin with a a, a critical response to a term that has been used both by the the dean of students and the dean experts. Academics are not experts. Plumbers are experts. Carpenters are experts. Uh, Academics are children of Descartes or Cartesians. We begin with doubt uh, and continue to doubt even when we uh, express uh, a thesis or a position. So we're not experts. We are um, doubters. Nonetheless, I've um, perhaps paradoxically entitled my brief remarks Scholarship as a Priestly Craft. I began my graduate studies under the tutelage of German refugee scholars. I was intimidated by the Teutonic inflected English of, of theirs. I was even more terrified by the aura of their prodigious learning. It was thus with fear and trembling that I submitted my first seminar paper as a fledgling, diffident graduate student to my professor of medieval philosophy. I was consumed by premonitions of doom and fleeting thoughts of suicide, which is true. With my paper in hand, he began quickly to thumb through the paper and in a sonorous Prussian voice joyfully exclaim, Fußnoten, wunderbar, Fußnoten, wunderbar. He didn't bother to read the paper, but just marveled at my lengthy, detailed footnotes. (laughs) 
His approval determined the course of my studies, indeed of my professional life. But I now wear the mantle of a professor is thanks to those footnotes. In some respects, my nigh five decades as a member of the professorial guild is but a footnote to those glorious, blessed footnotes. Inspired by my hair professor's enthusiastic approbation, I soon learned to share his reverence and that of my other German-trained mentors for a Fußnoten, which they deemed to be the heartbeat of scholarship. In a culture which implores us to prize money, excuse me, prizes, implores us to prize time as money, I would, in, in utter defiance of that dictum, bury myself in libraries and archives, and for hours upon hours, often weeks and months on end, uh, uh, on end to document. Uh, yeah, well, I, I can't read my own. That's the problem with footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hours upon week, uh, hours upon hours, often weeks upon months, on the, uh, on end to trace and document arcane historical details, ideologies of concepts and etymologies, only to have the record of my labors relegated to small print at the bottom of a page. But the significance of Fusnoten is not to be measured by any pragmatic criteria, for they are born of a, quintus, of a quasi-religious duty. And thus spake Friedrich Nietzsche. It's a pun on his famous book, Thus Spake Zarathustra. But need not mention that. But anyway, you, you learn it enough to pick up. <laughs> anyway, thus spake Nietzsche. In an age which was ever increasingly ruled by the frenetic cadence of urban life, and to extrapolate to our own era, fast food, high speed, internet, FedEx, and super fast bullet trains. Scholarship is, and now I quote from Nietzsche, is that venerable art which extracts from its followers the one thing above, one thing above all, to step aside, to leave themselves spare moments, to grow silent, and to become slow. The leisurely art of, of a goldsmith applied to language, an art which must be carried out slowly, fine work, and attains nothing if not in lento, softly. Philosophically, excuse me, philological attentiveness, to, uh, excuse me, philologically attentive scholarship is, quote again, and she is now more desirable than ever before. Thus it is the highest it is the highest attraction and incitement in an age of work, workers and scarecrows, that is, of haste and unseemly, immodestly hurry scurry, which is so eager to get things done at once, even every book, whether, it, whether old or new. Phonology itself, Nietzsche continues, perhaps will not so hurriedly get things done. It teaches how to read well that is slowly, profoundly, attentively, prudently, with inner thoughts, with the mental jo doors ajar, with, with delicate fingers and eyes. So spake Nietzsche. True to its pristine calling, scholarship assumes the posture of a quasi-theological dialectic, a metacritique of the pragmatic grammar that governs quotidian mundane realities. Biblical scholars speak of sacred discontent with everyday secular folly and vanity. To return for a moment to my first semester as a graduate student, I registered for a seminar on Kant's critique of pure reason, taught, yes, by two exiled German scholars, Herbert Marcuse and Kurt Wolff. In the course of a semester, not a quarter, but a semester, we read but three pages of the preface to the first edition of Kant's assessment of the limits of human knowledge. Three pages. We read slowly, indeed with reverential attention to detail, conceptual, and philological. It is said of the founder of modern Jewish studies, again in Germany, of course, Wissenschaft des Judentums, Leopold Zunz, that, I quote one of his students, 
possessed the piety and sacrificial attitude to research that to research that is indispensable to strict scientific investigation. He com- he combined with a, he combined it with a steadfast and conviction those on German Gesinnung, which resist the temptations of supposed popularity and the bowing before regnant systems. Again, end of quote. As heir to the mandate of his biblical forebears, Zuntz was prepared to smash all idols. A century later, Max Weber made similar claims in his essay, Scholarship as, as a Calling. The Germans a bit different, Wissenschaft als Beruf. One of the architects of the modern university, the philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fichte, in a lecture of 1805 on the scholar's vocation, in German again, Bestimmung des Gelehrten, celebrated scholarship as a priestly craft. That's the title of my paper. As custodians of the noblest and refined expressions of the human spirit, Fichte held scholars ought to regard themselves as but a link in a great train, train, excuse me, great chain of tradition, as dwarfs on the shoulders of giants. This injunction is is said to be said to have been formulated by 12th century French Jesuit savant. Its more familiar articulation in English is by Isaac Newton, who in 1675 exclaimed, and I quote, "If I have if I ever seen further than others." It is by virtue of standing on the shoulders of giants, the shoulders of giants, end of quote. Though beholden to the cumulative wisdom and learning of their predecessors, scholars are also beckoned to push the horizons of knowledge further, even should it entail a critical assessment and attendant revisions of inherited views and, and opinion. This critical reverence for a given intellectual tradition that scholars are to assume may be illustrated by a self-effacing ruminations, by the self-effacing ruminations of a 12th century Italian rabbi, Isaiah di Tarni. And I quote, should the son of Nun, that's Moses' sidekick as you recall, endorse a mistaken position, I would reject it out of hand. I do not hesitate to express my opinion regarding such matters in accordance with the modicum of intelligence allotted to me. I was never given to arrogant claims that my wisdom served me well. Instead, I applied myself to the parable of the philosophers. And this is a rabbi speaking. For I heard the following from the philosophers. The wisest of the philosophers was asked, we admit that our predecessors were wiser than we, and at the same time, we criticize their comments, often rejecting them and claiming that the truth rests with us. How is this possible? How is this kosher, if you wish? That's a, and it's my own elaboration. The wise philosopher responded, who sees further a dwarf or a giant? Surely a giant for his eyes his, his eyes are situated on a higher level than those of the dwarf. But if the dwarf is placed on the shoulders of a giant, who sees further? So we too are dwarfs astride the shoulders of giants. We master their wisdom and move beyond it. Due to their wisdom, we grow wise and can say that all we say is but, is but because of their greater because, excuse me, because they are greater than, than we. According to the Jewish tradition, and the Jewish tradition, a scholar, no matter how eminent he may be, is known as a Talmud Chacham, a student of a wise sage, a deed, a link in a chain of ever ongoing asymptotic human endeavor to gain infinite, absolute wisdom. For academic scholars, the footnote is a quintessential expression of the priestly ethos and the homage we duly owe to our ancestors and colleagues. There has been, however, in the last decades, especially in North America, uh, North American academia, a mock retreat from the footnote, increasingly scornful as a, a gratuitous affectation, uh, 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 excuse me, affectatious display of pedantry, the footnote is now most often denigrated 
truncated it and dispatched to an end note following the chapter, a chapter or, an, or the end of a book. Indicative of this contemptuous denigration of the footnote is a remark by the flamboyant British playwright Sir Noel Pierce Coward, who noted that having to read footnotes resembles having to go downstairs to answer the door while making while in the midst of making love. <laughs> I must admit, and this is a parenthetical comment, that I often take footnotes with me to bed. Which has not enhanced, <laughs> which has not enhanced my love life, and my dear wife, my poor wife, will attest to that. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's a question if I'm more infatuated footnotes or with my wife. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> the tarnished prestige of the footnote is due if my colleagues would allow me some mud of hyperbolic, a hyperbolic claim to the secularization of scholarship. Indicative of this process is the insinuation of, into the axiological landscape. Axiological is a, is a pompous an academic word meaning values. Uh, but, uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, indicative of this process of, is the insinuation into the axiological landscape of, of the scholar's calling. Uh, such as career, job, success, value concepts that are not only alien to the pristine ideal of scholarship as a priestly craft, but also downright antithetical to its spiritual universe. This heretical trend is not limited to North America, however. Just a month ago appeared in the German newspaper the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, an article which sounded the alarm that there is a lamentable overall inclination among contemporary German university students to renounce the traditional humanistic educational ideal, the German Bildungsideal, in favor of a career-oriented course of study. Alas, the imperious dictates of a market economy have increasingly left their insidious mark on the ethos of a university education. Indeed, that one now most often speaks of a career as opposed to a calling, a job which duly entails negotiating one's salary. Before I joined the faculty of the University of Chicago, I taught for some 30 years at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, which, with perhaps unwarranted hubris, claims to be the last great German university, and German to be the second most important Semitic language. That was supposed to be a joke as well. <laughs> It's one of the problems I have in telling jokes. I have to tell people that I'm telling them. <laughs> um, anyway. What legitimates this claim is that the Hebrew University still adheres to the ideal of an egalitarian salary structure. Within each rank, the faculty gets the same salary and benefits, and from one rank to another, there is but a minimal difference. In this respect, the Hebrew, the Hebrew University may indeed be the last great German university. For in Germany... There is a, a move to adopt the, the U.S. model of competitive salaries, which presumably guaranteed, guarantee excellence. But all is not lost, at least not at the Divinity School. And not only because we address the perennial and ultimately imponderable existential and metaphysical, metaphysical questions that have characterized religious discourse since humanity's expulsion from the Garden of Eden and the loss of innocence. The structure of the curriculum and the comp composition of the faculty at the Divinity School are primed by a genuinely pluralistic and interdisciplinary ethos. In effect, they affirm the building's ideal, which lays at the foundation of the modern university. As students at the Divinity School, you will be drawn into a vibrant and self-consciously inclusive, self-critical conversation in which anthropologists, historians, feminists, representatives of theistic and non-theistic religions participate, passionately participate. You may thus be surprised that we don't even agree on how to define religion, as we shouldn't. There is no one religion, indeed. There is no one Christianity, no one Judaism, no one Islam, no one Buddhism, no one Hinduism, or for that matter, one single species of atheism. 
Our conversation at the Divinity School is internally open-ended and subject to continuous revision. If scholarship is a pious craft, it is emphatically, or if you will, religiously undogmatic. Hence, our intuitions, as well as our analytical results, are subject our, subject, our subjective as well as our allegedly more objective insights are constantly checked by, checked and rechecked against the intuitions, analytical results, and insights of our colleagues, and I dare say students, whose cultural biases and individual blind spots may help to neutralize and cancel our own. The study of religion at, at the Divinity School is therefore preeminently a corporate undertaking a conversation animated by dialogical humility and pious respect for the voice of our colleagues, past and present. That's the footnote. It is a, com- it is a conversation which the footnote thus retains its overarching emblematic significance. On behalf, on behalf of my colleagues and veteran students at the Divinity School, I culturally welcome you, the incoming class, to join in this conversation. Welcome. But before I relinquish the, the, the podium, I want to uh, provide one more footnote, not to my lecture, but to this occasion. It would seem that uh, one of the qualifications to be dean is to have a birthday on the 28th of September. Uh, not only a dean, uh, Nirenberg has today a birthday, but also his predecessor, Dean Rosengarten, has a birthday on the 28th. So if any of you aspire to uh, become a dean, change the date. <laughs> anyway, please join me in wishing both Dean Rosengarten and Dean Nirenberg a happy birthday. Well, good morning. Um, first of all, um, my name is Sarah Jo Switek. I'm a PhD student in religious ethics. I want to say thank you for um, asking me to provide this small contribution this morning. I've chosen to read a selection from Bruce Lincoln's Theses on Method, which appeared in Method and Theory in the Study of Religion in 1996. I've chosen five statements that speak, I think, more directly to the importance of critical inquiry in the study of religion. First, number four, the same destabilizing and irreverent questions one might ask of any speech act ought to be posed of religious discourse. The first of these is, who speaks here? What person, group, or institution is responsible for a text, whatever its putative or apparent author? Beyond that, to what audience? In what immediate and broader context? through what system of mediations, with what interests, and further, of what would the speaker or speakers persuade the audience? What are the consequences if this project of persuasion should happen to succeed? Who wins what and how much? Who, conversely, loses? Number five, reverence is a religious and not a scholarly virtue. When good manners and good conscience cannot be reconciled, the demands of the latter ought to prevail. Number nine, critical inquiry need assume neither cynicism nor dissimulation to justify probing beneath the surface and not probe scholarly discourse and practice as much as any other. Number 12, although critical inquiry has become commonplace in other disciplines, It still offends many students of religion who denounce it as reductionism. This charge is meant to silence critique. The failure to treat religion as religion, that is, the refusal to ratify its claim of transcendent transcendent nature, excuse me, sacrosanct status, may be regarded as heresy and sacrilege by those who construct themselves as religious, but it is the starting point for those who construct themselves as historians. Number 13, when one permits those whom one studies to define the terms in which they will be understood, suspends one's interest in the temporal and contingent, or fails to distinguish between truths, truth claims, and regimes of truth, 
One has ceased to function as a historian or scholar. In that moment, a variety of roles are available, some perfectly respectable. Amunis, I knew I was going to mess that up. Amunen, Manuensis, thank you. Collector, friend, and advocate. And some less appealing, cheerleader, warrior, retailer of imported goods. None, however, should be confused with scholarship. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Derek Bouyan, and it is my privilege to serve as the president of the Divinity Stu Students Association this year. Uh, let me first extend a big thank you to the students, uh, staff, and faculty who have worked hard to make this week of orientation events possible. So thank you. And let me also extend my thanks to Deans Nuremberg and Fagelson for the invitation to speak this morning. For those of you who don't yet know, the Divinity Students Association in its current form uh, has operated as an independent nonprofit within the Divinity School since 1968. We are run for and by Divinity School students, and all Divinity School students are members. The DSA is run by a small board, and I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce this year's board members quickly, uh, if you'd stand. Vice President Blaise Gervais. Treasurer, Victoria Wick. Secretary, Amelia Parker. Grad Council Representative, Matthew Johnson. And our funding chairperson, Nicole Yan. As many have already noted this morning, today we gather as a Divinity School community. We gather for a whole host of reasons to exchange information to connect with colleagues and friends, to make friends, to share a meal, to hear others' wisdom, to share our own, to reflect together. And as we, the Divinity School community, gather here today, I can't help but remark on the centrality of gathering to the DSA's work in the life of the Divinity School. Give me 90 seconds of back-of-the-napkin linguistic analysis, and I'll explain what I mean. In its familiar current usages, to gather as a verb is rather multifaceted. Four examples particularly help illustrate the place of the DSA in the life of the school. First, to gather is locative. This happens when we pair it with a preposition. For example, we gather at a conference. We gather among friends. We gather around the piano, around the seminar table. And the DSA works to bring us together in this way. It brings us together in and out of Swift Hall. Students, faculty, staff gather at our twice quarterly four to eight socials. We gather at the numerous events hosted by the student clubs, among our peers at a 101 about Hildegard von Bingen, over a drink at a devout happy hour, we, as well as most of the university, gather at Grounds of Being. Second, to gather is importantly object-oriented. Here, there's a direct object, and we gather it. We gather funds. We gather data. We gather support. DSA also operates in this way. We gather useful information for students and publish it on our website and in the weekly DSA Digest. We gather funds to support student research, professional development, and the social life of the Divinity School. We gather support for students. Third, gathering is reflexive sometimes. And this happens when what we gather is self-referential. We gather ourselves. Uh, we gather our thoughts. We gather our strength. And the DSA supports students here, too. The Swift Cares Grant helps students to gather themselves in the face of an unexpected crisis. Um, other grants support students, perhaps, when they're gathering their thoughts before a conference presentation or gathering their courage as they prepare to learn a new language, for example. Fourth and finally, to gather is performative. Perhaps I'm stating the obvious here, but 
Gathering is an act, importantly so. It's something we do together. We gather. It's something we're doing right now. And this collective activity, this communal performance, uh, this gathering, constitutes the divinity school. One can easily note, we are gathered. But in the same breath, one must also add that gathered, we are. Which brings us back to today. Here we are, gathered to mark the beginning of another year as members of the Divinity School community. The DSA, for its part, looks forward to the diverse gatherings that will make up another year in Swift Hall. And in the spirit of this gathering, let me wish all of you, on behalf of the Divinity Students Association, the very best for the year ahead. Good morning. Thank you, Dean Fagelson and Dean Nuremberg, for allowing me to contribute to today's ceremony. I'll be reading from and sharing a small reflection on an excerpt from the Mundaka Upanishad. As many of you know, the, the Upanishads are a set of texts affixed to the end of the Vedas, the most revered and ancient of Hindu scriptures. I believe this passage teaches us that the themes of our ceremony today are more ancient than we sometimes envision. The study of religion and curiosity about religion is likely as old as humanity itself. So from the Mundaka 1.1 to 1.4. Brahma arose as the first among the gods, as the creator of all, the guardian of the world. He taught Brahma Vidya, the greatest of all knowledge, to his firstborn son, Atharvan. Atharvan took that knowledge which Brahma had bequeathed to him, and he taught it to Angir. Angir then taught, taught it to Bharadvaj, and Bharadvaj to the sage Angira. Once, Shonaka respectfully approached Angira the sage and asked him, what is that one teaching by knowing which all else is understood? Angira responded in accordance with the Brahmvidya that he had been taught. He said, there are two types of knowledge that one ought to learn, Paravidya, that is transcendent, and Apara, a mundane type of knowledge. The lower Aparavidya consists of the Rigved, the Yajurved, the Samaved, the Atharvaved, linguistics, ritual theory, etymology, poetics, meter, astronomy, etc., etc. The higher form of knowledge is that by which Akshar is understood. There are two themes in these, in, the, in these verses that are relevant for us today. First, Note that this text meticulously outlines a tradition of teaching. The text is trying to communicate an awareness that knowledge is informed by those that came before us. All of the faculty here today, and not here today, are here at the Divinity School are themselves, or were themselves once students. And now they are bearers of great intellectual traditions. Now, us incoming students, so too are we part of those traditions. Whether that tradition is defined as Brahma, Bharadvaj, and Shonak, or Eliada, Jay-Z, Smith, that is, uh, and Lincoln, tradition in part defines our knowledge. I hope that we do not pretend otherwise. Second, we should note that this passage relegates even the Vedas, the most revered and central of Hindu texts, to upara, mundane knowledge. It carries the sense that the texts that texts are just tools for understanding something greater. But avidya, therefore, is not unlike the study of religion. Religion is a subject that animates so many other facets of, of, huma of humanity. The text says that linguistics, ritual theory, poetics, perhaps today we may add anthropology, sociology, history, all of these things pale in comparison to that other so-called transcendent knowledge that transcendent human phenomenon. Religion is indeed that one elusive teaching through, through which so many others are understood. Thank you.
It is a delicious and yet unsettling moment just now, isn't it? This little slice of silence. The pause between what just happened, all those excellent and almost but not quite expert words, and what is yet to come, what will be. Old preachers like me know to cherish that moment, that silence between one's approach to the pulpit and one's opening of the text and one's beginning to speak. Inherited homiletic wisdom observed that it is in this silence and only in that silence that one's entire audience is actually paying attention. (laughs) As soon as the speaker opens her mouth, one hearer disagrees, another becomes disenchanted, several more pick up their phones to look at the incoming texts, and still others simply lose their connection, their weary, they're hungry, it's lunchtime. But in the silence, those losses are not quite yet. Because in the space that opens up on the brink of speech, we don't yet know what is about to happen. For now, in the silence, we are all here together in our wondering what will be. Many of you in this room have spent hours already this week in this very space preparing for the weeks to come and orienting yourselves to this new community. You are actually some steps ahead of the rest of us whose bodies have arrived here this morning but whose minds might still be clinging to the unfinished summer writing project or the afterglow of travel, or the exhilaration of internship, or the promise of one last weekend of summer warmth. But whoever we are, wherever we've come from, whether we've only this week entered these halls, or whether we have returned here year after year after year after year, In this moment, in this pause, in this silence, we stand together in the very near presence of the unknown and the unknowable, in the presence of possibility expanding, in the presence of mind stretching and stirring, in the presence of curiosity awakening, in the presence of knowledge growing, and perhaps even in the presence of newness, in the presence of that which is already breaking in even now, in the presence, might we dare to say it, of change. I want to invite us in this last moment to savor one more helping of that silence. It is a rare commodity, silence, in a place like this one. The absence of speech or sound or assertion. And yet, our human languages are unintelligible without silence. There is no meaning in our words without the spaces between them. And so perhaps there is no real wisdom without the silence, without this space to orient ourselves to our surroundings, to our colleagues in this room, to the community around this place which both hosts us and demands yet more than we have given to the palpable waves of pain and anger and deep yearning that permeate 
our times. Generations ago, an ancient scribe observed that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's a phrase overflowing with interpretations, of course, but meaning at the very least that the wisdom we must seek to cultivate, for which knowledge lays the foundation and truth is the midwife, that wisdom requires us to know who and where we are, how and when we began and will end, for whom and for what we are given. This discernment, this wisdom, is the real goal of all human learning. It's our true vocation, and it's our life's great and ongoing orientation. It begins anew, that orientation, with every silence. And so I invite you to join me in beginning this way. Let's begin our year together with one more moment of silence. An invitation to return to that space of anticipation, to that place of not knowing, to that opening in which to savor all that lies ahead alongside all who will make that journey with you. In that silence, acknowledge those whose efforts and example and footnotes preceded you. Those who brought you to be corporeally and spiritually and intellectually, those whose efforts brought you here. In that silence, hold alongside your own hopes and desires the aspirations of those who sit around you and among you this morning and who will accompany you in these classrooms and these hallways. And in this silence, join forces too with the yearning and the questions and the restlessness and the wild imaginings that led you to this moment and to this room. Join forces with yourself and those yearnings and hold them fast in the silence. May all this be so. Let us begin. Thank you, everybody. That concludes the ceremony. Um, You are welcome to join us for lunch downstairs uh, in the common room and in the courtyard, so long as it's not raining.